Hello, today I will be talking to you about online identity theft. Online identity theft involves stealing credit card numbers, social security numbers, personal information, all with the aid of a computer. This form of theft is easily carried out than traditional forms of theft because you can do this from anywhere. Um, you can do this from home. Uh, a common practice is hacking into databases of commercial establishments and basically online identity theft is extremely profitable if pulled off because you can steal a lot of information without doing a lot of work. One common practice is called phishing. What phishing is, is when consumers are targeted through false emails. So basically someone can send you uh, a false email saying they're a bank, they're a credit card company and basically what they do is they ask you to provide or update your information on the account and so people sometimes believe this and they will send your username, their password and any information that they sent because they think it's actually from you know a trusted source and this is how thieves access your information to your accounts and basically steal your money uh, a way that they steal your information is through key logging programs and basically what these programs do is copy computer users keystrokes um, these programs are placed on certain websites email messages uh, email attachments or on software downloads so basically you can be downloading something that you think is from a trusted email or a trusted website but you're actually downloading these hidden programs called spyware or trojan horses and they're used to figure out your usernames, your passwords, basically any information to access these accounts to steal your information or to steal your money and these programs can be used internationally and it usually is internationally so basically anyone from anywhere can be stealing information with these key logging programs um, finally um, more than 50 percent of identity thefts involve corporate insiders so these identity thieves come from the inside um, all because they're skilled employees, they know how to access the information, they have the authorization to computer usage, to basically all this trusted information. And basically this is failure of the company's personnel security that causes these people to steal information. Um, companies also fail to use firewalls to protect the customer's information. And sometimes, sadly, companies sell your information to crooks and that's how third parties gather your information and steal your information. And that is all. Hello, my name is Christopher Oliva and I'm here to talk about online gambling. Uh, it's illegal in the United States. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why the United States hasn't been able to uh, stop against online gambling. One of them being the fact that uh, online gambling is through the internet, so it's global and borderless. So there's not really uh, a for sure way to stopping it. Uh, another thing is the lack of law enforcement that is needed. Uh, reasons why it's illegal in the state is because it, uh, uh, minors can gamble. Uh, they want to keep an eye on that. Uh, compulsive gamblers can go bankrupt easily because they don't have uh, they don't keep track of their funds because it is electronically, so they can just sign up on their bank accounts and drain it. Uh, potential for fraud as well as anything that's online is uh they can get access to your information like that uh another thing is it can lead to online uh, organized crime like the mobs and stuff like that another thing is that uh, uh criminals can launder their money through uh gambling easier than they like they did in back in the days well, uh, during the cocaine incidents uh reasons why uh, what would happen if we did legalize it uh they would be able to pull revenue of nine million dollars in taxes alone but uh, and it helps them regulate it but because uh, not a lot of people want to do the regulations and take the time to monitor minors and prevent compulsive gamblers they decided that uh, the uh, the cons of the matter outweigh the pros in this incident uh, and gambling tends to be uh, uh, towards 
younger younger people uh, who like to try new things. They're also uh, different from compulsive gamblers because they do have uh, steady jobs and they can monitor how much they're spending one online gambling than those who uh, gamble in uh, on the offline uh, accounts. And that's pretty much what gambling is, uh, online gambling is uh, down to. Thank you very much. To engage in cyber sex, a lot of people refer to internet ads, online chat rooms, or personals found on websites such as Craigslist. Cyber sex is essentially the exchange of erotic photos and conversations which could lead to masturbation or potentially hookups. When it comes to cyber sex, there are five assumptions as to why people partake in it. Number one, the ability to be anonymous. A lot of people that engage in cyber sex don't exactly want their identity to be exposed due to the fact that they could have a wife and kids, could be very high up in their position at work, or just too shy to say who they really are. Number two, it gives people the confidence to find sexual partners. Due to the internet being fast, easy, and convenient, people rely on cyber sex instead of going out into the real world to attempt to find people that have similar interests. Number three, people can engage in their wildest fantasies without ruining their real lives. Number four, it gives people an excuse to masturbate. And number five, partaking in cyber sex could actually help people partake in real sex. Some people refuse to go out into the real world and spend all that time trying to find their perfect match. So, in, to, so to speed things up a little quicker, people go straight to the internet. I mean, when I, internet porn or cyber porn isn't, a new, isn't new to society because once the internet was invented, people began trading naughty pictures. By the year of 1997, an online guide of cyber porn said that there was an estimated 900 porn sites on the web. In 1998, that increased to 900 to about 20 to 30,000. By 2001, the top five porn sites received nearly two times more visits than the top five news sites. Cyber porn brought in nearly $700 million a year, becoming a big business, just as popular as sports and weather sites. A once upon a time stripper gave up stripping once her revenue from cyber porn went up. As a stripper, she was making around $1,500 a month. However, after going to the web, on her revenue increased to around ten to 15000 If you think that's a lot, a 23-year-old man <clears throat> made approximately $20 million in a year after he formed a company called Internet Entertainment, which offered a wide range of types of pornography. One of the most popular types of cyber porn viewed is called live video, which is where the performance is given via video and is seen on the computer live. This type of cyber porn also offers a viewer to chat with the performers. Even though live video is one of the most popular types of cyber porn being viewed, they also offer a variety of virtual rooms from bedrooms where the performer rolls around in the bed, the gym where the performer is working out naked. C cyber porn has become very profitable, which has even turned some companies into respectable giants in the corporate world of Wall Street. Cyber porn has become so popular over the years for the reason that it can be seen in the privacy of one's home. So chronic and cur curious viewers can avoid the awkwardness of walking into adult stores, back rooms of video of movie shops, and even having to spend money. However, this popularity cyber porn has gained has parents worried because the cyber porn's websites are so easily accessed. Children that are curious about sex are just a couple of clicks away. Accessing cyber porn and their parents would have no clue. There are many reasons why youngsters may occasionally watch porn. One, they can obtain a video from home without having to show ID in the movie store. Two, they can download whatever part they find interesting to them rather than having to buy a whole movie. Finally, they can explore sex without anyone knowing. Children may have access to porn, however, in the next section we will talk about how the typical viewer of cyber porn are, are, are actually men over the age of 30. In 1995, the Senate tried passing a bill prohibiting anyone from making indecent material and that can be available to children under the age of 18. In this bill, however, did not pass because people began to argue that this was violating the First Amendment of free speech. Also, they feared it could transform the vast library of the internet into a children's reading room. 
where anything offered online would only be for kids. My section is on social, social profile of cyber porn surfers. This is a pretty short section, but overall it taught me a lot of things that I had no idea about. For starters, um, the regular consumers of cyber porn, they're not regular teenagers that are just crazy over sex and things like that that people might assume. They're actually older and married men. Demographics actually show that two-thirds of those viewers are more than 30 years old, most married, white, and middle class. Usually these people lack happiness in marriage, and they also don't have a strong belief to a religion. When you lack happiness in marriage, they look for something else to keep them entertained, just so, you know, fights or divorce won't happen within their marriage. 70% of cyber porn traffic actually occurs during work hours. It doesn't occur at home, it doesn't occur when kids get out of school, it actually occurs during work. They say that teenagers are much less motivated to view it because it's not a big deal to them. As they were growing up, they had, this, is, this was normal, like they saw things like this around all the time. They had different options to view this, different ways, it wasn't something that was abnormal to them. Whereas older men, this is more interesting to them because this isn't what they had growing up. Back then, they had different ways of watching porn and this and that. So for them, it's a lot more interesting and it just makes them want to do it more. They get more out of it. Uh, lastly, child porn and cyberspace. That shows about the same demographics as what was listed above. They're usually white men in their 30s and 40s. The interesting about this is it doesn't matter about what occupation they're in. They've done tests and studies and it showed that people that are unemployed to taxi drivers, to scientists, to professional, whatever you can think of, they all participate in this. It's not just different occupations or different rich or poor, healthy or not healthy, it doesn't matter. And also they're kind of looked at differently because they're attracted to younger children and they have a discomfort with adult women because of that. So people who usually do this, um, they stand out and they stand out because of those two characteristics. My name is Valerie, I'm doing chapter 11. Online affairs are two individuals sitting in front of their computer in different locations and engaging in erotic conversation. Sharing sexual fantasies or sexual self-simulation self such as masturbation. Some people may not believe that online affairs are not a case of infidelity for the following reasons. It's just a friendship, it's merely flirtation or fun, it involves a relationship with an object, the computer, not a real human being. It involves two people who have never met in person and do not ever intend to meet. It can't be infidelity because no physical sex takes place. This is how participants in online affairs rationalize their betrayal of their spouses. As research has indicated, most people in the general public consider online affairs just as real as offline affairs. Online infidelity is highly likely to lead to mar marital discord, separation, or divorce, just as offline affairs is. Reasons for online affairs. Cyber cheating is the same as offline cheating, and spouses that have been unfaithful would be, feel hurt and react in the same negative way as traditional infidelity. Online infidelity is more appealing, and one reason for this is anonymy of cyber communication. Anonymity enables people to commit infidelity without the fear of getting caught by their betrayal spouse. Another reason is, the finding, is that finding partners all over the world without leaving one's familiar and comfortable home or office. Last reason is the escapism. This enables the user to escape from the stresses of strain, real life, and into the fantasy world. Example, lonely wife is in an empty marriage is desired by, by her many cyber partners. Sexual insecure husbands can transform into a hot cyber lover whom with all women in that chat room fight over. For these reasons, online infidelity can progress to offline infidelity. Research has shown that 30% of married people who have off online affairs meet their par partners in person and have sex with them. Most people already plan on going offline to have the sexual encounter when they initiate the online search for partners. Prejudice and discrimination 
in cyberspace. Prejudice is a covert psychological state such as unjust thoughts and feelings against the minorities, whereas discrimination is overt, characterized by disadvantageous treatments of the minorities. Discrimination is a treatment or consideration of or making a distinction in favor of or against a person or thing based on the group, class, or category to which that person or thing is perceived to belong to rather than on individual merit. The availability of the internet makes it easier for people to express their prejudice and not face any consequences for their actions. Anonymity helps the users conceal their true identity. There are various ways in which people become anonymous on websites and chat rooms all throughout the world. This includes the United States, Europe, and Asia. There is more likeliness that prejudice is expressed online than in face-to-face -face interactions. There are anti-prejudice efforts to combat prejudice and promote tolerance online. However, there still needs to be research on how well it works, in theory, of them helping bullying on cyberspace. At the same time, it makes it hard for people to discriminate against minorities online. An anonymity that serves two different kinds of people, bigot and potential victims. People in cyberspace are less likely to practice discrimination than prejudice because in an on in in face of face interaction where a person is being interviewed it is easy for them to uh, practice the discrimination when the person is being interviewed and then discriminated for their race or gender or anything like that Hello, my name is Jessica Perez and I will be discussing stalking through cyberspace. Stalking through cyberspace or cyber stalking involves the use of the internet or email to repeatedly harass or threaten another person. It makes it difficult to put a face to the cyber stalker, which makes it difficult to punish the cyber stalker. Cyber stalking may seem less harmful than regular stalking, but it is not. Cyber stalkers have a greater access to personal data. Cyber stalkers don't stalk a person physically, but they can cause more harm because of the easy access to the web. Cyber stalkers and stalkers have similar characteristics. Cyber stalkers are mostly male and older. Cyber stalkers usually know their victims. Only a few are strangers to their victims. Mentally normal persons can also be cyber stalkers. My name is Adriana Navarrete and my topic is computer hacking. The definition of computer hacking is when it involves breaking into a computer network and then proceeding to plant viruses, steal data, change usernames and passwords, manipulate web pages or explore the network. A most well known form of computer hacking is called computer sabotage, the planting of viruses in computers. The virus planted in the computer is designated to delete important files or cause computers to function abnormally. Once it's infected, the virus can spread quickly from one machine to another with the aid of the users. As a consequence, virtually everybody who uses a computer has been a victim. A similar form of computer sabotage is the creation and dissemination of a worm. The definition of that is that it is a malicious program that makes so many copies of itself without any assistance from a computer user that it finally crashes the computer. Hacking can be relatively innocent and harmless only when someone is breaking into computer for the challenge and then notifying system administrators how the break-in was done so they can improve their network security. Much of the hacking relies on what the hacker community calls social engineering. The definition of social engineering is tricking a company's employees into revealing 
passwords or other secret information by posing. An example would be a colleague or, an, or a trusted insider. One of the most striking things about hacking is that it is mostly a juvenile deviance. Below is a comparison to juvenile deviance. First, hacking is an overwhelmingly male activity because males have greater interest in mathematical or logical problems, problem solving, as well as in mastery over machines and domination over others. Second, hackers tend to come from dysfunctional families, experience parental neglect, parental conflict or divorce physical abuse, and or parents' alcoholism. Despite such family problems, some hackers can be normal kids, largely indistinguishable from their peers. Third, hackers associate with a peer group and engage in activities encouraged by the group. An example would be participating in competitions to outhack each other. Hi, I'm Natalie Moran, and I'll be doing terrorism in cyberspace. Terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda now use the internet in order to plan out their terrorist acts. They will use code words on various websites in order to get in contact with each other. Once the message is received between the members, the code is then deleted. They will use different emails almost every time when contacting each other. A great direct attack on the U.S. by terrorists would be a hack on computer networks. A hack could destroy the country's infrastructure, which is what provides various services for the country, for example, water and power, oil, banking, etc. Such a hack has never happened, but the possibility is still lurking. Computers can be used as weapons, reaching the U.S. easier than any missile could. Due to the increase of the digital world, the country relies more on computers. Therefore, a physical attack is not necessary in order to cause chaos to the country and to bring danger to the lives of the people. Cyber terrorism is only a threat. There has not been any attacks on the U.S. through the internet. Computer hacking has happened, but not into the whole country's infrastructure. For that to happen, terrorists must have specialized knowledge, which critics believe will likely not happen anytime soon. Hi, my name is Nathan Nguyen. I'm doing chapter 11 on uh, a global perspective of cyber deviance. Uh, first of all, it is a truly global and borderless crime. It can take place anywhere at any time. Um, for example, in Nigeria, a uh, scam cheated Americans out of $5 billion in, from the early 1980s to the 1996. Um, scam like that uh, still take place, but in a smaller perspective. Um, for uh, example, today's uh, society is email scam, phone scam, and uh, among other things like credit card scam and identity theft. Um, for the more globally, uh, the most cyber deviants take place and originate in the United States, followed by the United Kingdom and Nigeria. The uh, crime report for cybercrime shot from the 1993 to 2000 uh, rapidly, and two of the main reasons for the increase of the crimes is because the increase of the computer and the internet. Um, also, the second reason is the lack of law enforcement against cybercrime. And um, cybercrime is really, uh, really severe, for example, in Russia, Eastern Europe, and countries with high unemployment rates. And also in uh, criminal groups are now recruiting computer savvy through chat room. And for example, South Korea, they are hosting bogus hacking contests and recruit the most promises uh, young consistent, uh, contestant in order to uh, provide and increase their um, hacking skills. And that's it.